um, Lawrence Haddad, um, who I'm really thrilled is here today. Um, Lawrence is um, co-author um, and chair of the Independent Expert Group, which writes the Global Nutrition Report. Um, he co-chairs co that with Corinna, who will be um, chairing the second half of tona tonight's um, event. Um, Lawrence has really been at the forefront of international nutrition for many, many years, um, but I think has been really critical in trying to change the narrative around all forms of malnutrition, undernutrition, overweight and obesity, and trying to forge a kind of policy direction and accountability around that narrative, and it's really been um, incredible leadership. So, um, Lawrence, please do come and tell us about the Global Nutrition Report. Um, thanks, Anna. It's great to be here. Um, if I drift off, it's because I'm looking at the the fun fantastic. I'm already drifting off. <laughs> looking at the looking at the fantastic view behind me. Um, um, as as Anna said, I co-chair uh, this this thing, the Global Nutrition Report, with uh, Corinna, who's right here. Um, Boyd is also on our independent expert group. And this report, I, I think you've all got one, a copy of it. It's trying to do three things. It's trying to improve the accountability in the nutrition sector in general, malnutrition in all its forms. It's trying to assess progress, how well are we doing in terms of outcomes, but also in terms of actions and spending and policies and, leg and legislation and laws. And it's trying to do a third thing, which is uh, I identify actions that will accelerate our progress. Um, as Boyd said, we're all in this together. Uh, think about the global numbers, 800 million hungry, uh, 1.9 billion overweight, 2 billion micronutrient malnourished, um, 200 million kids um, in one way or another stunted. Uh, when you add all those numbers up together, they all overlap. That's about three to four billion people. So one in two people on the planet is not being served, are not being served by their food systems. So it's a very serious problem. My job tonight is to hit you with lots of very severe looking uh, bar charts in red. I'm sorry, they're in red. Um, to give you a sense of what the UK's um, position is vis-a-vis -vis some of the data in this report, vis-a-vis -vis other countries in, in Europe, but also I think the US and, uh, and Australia and New Zealand. So, I can't move the chart, um, come on. <laughs> is it arrow down? Alex, help. There's two lots. <laughs> it's way too complicated. Oh, that one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. What was it that Boyd said about teaching us to communicate? So this is my outline. Um, what's happening on nutrition status? What's happening on drivers? Policy and regulation. A uh, little bit on missing data and some conclusions for you. So... This, uh, the report, it, th these, these things are not in the report, but there are 193 of these things, two-page summaries for each country on a whole range of indicators of outcomes, policies, programs, legislation, uh, spending, etc. And as Boyd said, no, no single country has a monopoly on the problems of malnutrition, and no single country has a monopoly on the solutions, right? So we have to find... We all, we all have malnutrition and we all have to find the solutions together. Um, a lot of the data that I'm really going to be reporting on tonight are in these two-page summaries. And I've put a, a bunch of them at the back for you in case any of you would like to take them away. So here's the first one. So low birth weight's really important as a marker of a whole range of um, health vulnerabilities. It's very important for... Um, for low-income families, but also for other kinds of families. And it's a very important marker of how good a start in life a child gets. So here's the, the UK's uh, number relative to other countries in a similar income bracket. So kind of in the, in the, uh, in the, in the middle there. Um, anemia in women of reproductive age is obviously a very key uh, nutrition outcome. Um, women who have anemia are low energy, um, they can't do a whole range of things. It affects mental development. Uh, it's a very serious problem. It's, it's worldwide. It's a massive problem. And even in high-income countries, you can see the rates, the estimated rates of, of anemia uh, of, of women of reproductive age, that's between uh, 15 and 49, is extraordinarily high. The UK is one of the better uh, rates, but it's still 15%, if you believe these numbers from the World Health Organization. 
adult overweight and obesity, um, the global prevalence for adult overweight and obesity is about, um, oh, it's about uh, in, the, in the high 20s, the global prevalence. And here you can see these high income countries. This is overweight and obesity combined. You can see where the UK is, 63%. These are again WHO estimates for adults. Um, pretty much all the countries are pretty much the same level. Uh, the reason they're in red is that, as Boyd said, none of the countries have managed to stop this and, and turn it back. And if, if any of these had managed to stop it or turn it back, the bars would be in green, indicating that. But they're not. None of these countries, in fact, out of, out of all the countries in the world, I think only two or three are doing anything to slow it down and reverse it, and those are tiny island states. So n none of the major countries are making any progress here. Same for adult obesity, which is a subset of that previous group I just showed you. Again, um, UK, relative to other countries, is doing worse here than it was in the previous slide, 28% adult obesity. So 28% of all adults in the UK, estimated by the WHO to be obese, according to that body mass index cutoff. Um, this is some English data that's not in the Global Nutrition Report. To be in the Global Nutrition Report, you have to submit, the, each country has to submit its data to the UN systems because all of our, most of our data are drawn from UN system data. And the UK, um, for some of its indicators, doesn't collect the kinds of things that the UN uh, would expect uh, all countries to collect. So, for example, there is no under five age stunting rate, kids who are short length and short height for their age. The UK just doesn't collect that. So, um, uh, and it doesn't collect overweight for under fives either, which the UN system would like it to report on. So here's some UK, uh, some English data. It's not even UK data, it's English data from uh, obviously UK sources. I just wanted to show this to you. Overweight children, this is in reception. Um, these are all kids in reception, 22.6% overweight. Uh, obese adolescents, 17% boys, 22% uh, girls. So, you know, even if you don't believe the UN numbers, these are English numbers, and they're, they're pretty serious. Raised blood pressure, which is obviously a really uh, very important um, risk factor for an, 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 an important uh, non-communicable disease. Uh, UK is 38% of the population has raised blood pressure. Um, raised blood cholesterol, again, 63% raised blood cholesterol, UK. Uh, all the countries are high, but the UK seems to be particularly uh, bad off relative to the others. Um, interestingly, the UK is one at the low end of the raised blood glucose level, uh, 7%. Um, USA is, is the highest at 11%. In terms of the things that drive these things that we care about, availability of fruits and vegetables, this is the availability, so not consumption, but how much is produced. The UK is roughly in the middle of all the other countries, and that's roughly in line with the recommended levels. In terms of expenditure, for what do consumers actually spend on fruits and vegetables, and I'm picking fruits and vegetables because it's one of the sort of few unambiguously good things. It's good for undernutrition, but also good for uh, it's a, a component of a healthy diet. UK again kind of in the middle there. But when it comes to fresh food purchased, the UK, and we think fresh food is generally better for health than highly processed or, or some processed foods, um, the UK is, is, is the last, come bottom of the table in this. Um, so that's really not very good. In terms of the kinds of things that Boyd said, we can't hold uh, countries and governments solely accountable for the outcomes, because there's lots of factors that drive the outcomes, but we can hold them accountable for whether they sign up or implement a policy. So here's some data on uh, three slides on policy. One is on um, implementation, the availability and stage of implementation of guidelines and protocols and standards on hypertension. So the UK is, has, has gone some way to implement, but not fully. The countries in green have fully implemented, the UK has not. Uh, again, for diabetes, standards, protocols, management, the UK has gone some way, but not fully implemented, unlike some of these other countries. And um, another one is on um, breast, uh, breastfeeding and uh, the, the application of the International Code of Marketing on Breast Milk Substitutes. And we've got a very low, a very low percentage of um, babies who are exclusively breastfed uh, for the first six months of life, if you believe that number, and there's no reason to not believe that number. So. There's lots of policy things the UK could be doing well on. UK actually does pretty well on sustainability in terms of 
um, total emissions in terms of CO2 equivalents from its agriculture and its food systems, but that's largely because unlike Boyd's homeland and where he lives, uh, we don't have as many uh, ruminants um, <laughs> as they do, and they, they're bad for uh, carbon emissions, uh, or greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so summary, um, got it. UK perform, I'll be two minutes. UK performance relative to comparators. In terms of outcomes, uh, UK is pretty poor in terms of overweight, obesity, and raised blood cholesterol. Middling in, these in low birth weight and uh, raised blood pressure, and relatively good in terms of anemia and raised blood sugar. In terms of determinants, pretty poor in exclusive breastfeeding and fresh food purchases. Middling in availability of fruits and vegetables and actually purchase of those fruits and vegetables. Policy and legislation, middling on breast milk substitute codes, hypertension and diabetes protocol implementation. So middling on policy implementation and good on CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I want, don't want to go that way. I'm going the wrong way here. Um, in terms of missing indicators, the UK is in the middle again uh, in terms of missing data. And it's gonna, the UK is going to have to get better at this because the Sustainable Development Goals for all countries, the MDGs were just for low and middle income countries, but all countries are going to be expected to submit data to the UN system and the SDG process. And the UK again is somewhere in the middle. So final slide, UK system, food system is, I think, nutritionally weak compared to other high income countries. Uh, for example, fresh food purchases, obesity and overweight rates. And even when it's good or middling relative to the other countries, it's still actually, the absolute levels are still pretty <coughs> poor. You know, those, those levels are high. Even if the UK is doing well relative to the others, that the absolute numbers are, are very important. There's significant scope to improve implementation of protocols and code application and plenty of missing UK data when reporting on global goals. And the SDGs are for every country. And the UK is going to have to do better if it's going to be an accountable player in the SDG process. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of sobering data there. Um, we're going to move on now to um, some of the Food Foundation's work, um, which actually is the first step of the journey.